the thing for the Rettelbach subdivision ARP is in our, uh, if you do a new agenda or do something, it'll show up. Oh. She said just to refresh, I don't know. I didn't know how to refresh. I thought it was meant to have a scotch. That'll work too. So the purpose behind that design basis memorandum was just to outline or summarize the, the basis for the drainage system. The overall intent is to continue to divert it to the east and to the west. Uh, and then that's what the design for the drainage system is based on. Previous to this, it clearly stated that the drainage going to the west was going to be diverted into Lake Newell. It has been revised to simply say it's going to be directed to a receiving area and then the eastern irrigation district is going to be the one that ends up making a determination as to where it goes from there. So laying this WSP uh, letter basically, is that's going to be part of the package. That's right. This letter is the Schedule D that's attached to the rest of the document. See that? And so, um, was it Ellen that had made the motion earlier? So we'll go to <clears throat> Ellen's motion then to uh, for first reading. If there's no other questions or comments, Kelly. So my question is, um, once this hits the papers, there's going to be all kinds of questions as to impact, right? So you're you're prepared for that. We had met with. That's. We had met with Ron and with Orville and indicated that the plan was to bring it forward for first reading. A document like this requires a public hearing and that we anticipate taking place for the second meeting in April. The public hearing would be advertised. Ron will have an opportunity to notify his tenants that this is what the proposed schedule is and if they have an interest in coming out we would anticipate that that's when they would be here to go through the detail. Today was just to simply get it into that process. Any other questions? All in favor of the motion? Opposed? Motion is carried for first reading. All right. Todd and Will will go to your item.
Hello again. Hello. Are we Hello. not videoing today? Pardon me? No video today? No. Oh, is it online? Oh. You are being recorded. Okay. <laughs> just just <laughs> double checking how formal I had to be. <laughs> Don't change, Todd. <laughs> What's that, being formal? Oh, God. Yeah. You guys wait. Will's is up next, and Will does a much better job in front of a camera than I do. <laughs> All right, so I think we've heard Todd quite a bit in the last month because we were late with the January report, and then we had the first meeting of March that I gave a little bit of a breakdown, but this is our formal uh, report for kind of up until March. Uh, we do have some strict man available for sale. Uh, we did talk to PMRA, no real good word or any word really um, in respect to strict nine being uh, re-registered into the future. Um, but we have started to sell some now and uh, that's good because I, I don't think that everybody can drive over enough gophers to maintain the population. So we'll try and get some strict nine out and, and keep things maintained. Uh, we did uh, bring in 935 coyotes, so that's down 317 from last year, but I think uh, on par for a normal season for sure. Uh, we had four whole rentals, yep, two scales and two skunk traps, so that's exciting. Guys were busy with rentals. Uh, we have everybody hired now, seasonal staff-wise, and uh, I think it's going to be great. Uh, two new employees, uh, I think both from uh, north of the 550, right, or 544? Yeah, Millicent and Jim. So we're going on the other side. For years, we had everybody coming from Rolling Hills and Scandia, so now we're going the other direction. I think, uh, yeah, so in, in talks of adding new members, I guess we have to talk about the retirement. So Harold Forrest is going to leave us in September. I imagine everybody got that email. So exciting for him, uh, but just add some extra challenges for us going into the fall of this year. Good news, the winters are typically slower for us, so we have lots of time to get whoever's new on board and, and ready to go. Uh, yeah, we got all our partnerships going. I think we've talked to just about everybody so far, setting up meetings for kind of the end of March, so we'll have uh, a busy couple weeks ahead of us. Emerson's looking good, Christine's coming back, um, and we're going to open up on May 15th. And I think we have some early projects to do uh, through, through the budget, put in a couple culverts and um, a little bit of a parking structure in the back end. So we're excited to get those going. EFPs are doing well. I think Catherine is just about done now that calving is kind of here and seating is right around the corner. Looks like everybody's uh, shutting down the uh, paperwork side of environmental farm plans anyway. And then we are, of course, going to be doing the uh, weed inspectors training for municipal staff again. This spring, it's going to be June 5th in Rolling, or sorry, in Rainier. Um, so we have a few people coming from the province, although they're not technically allowed to tell me that they're coming because they weren't even allowed to respond to uh, my emails. So I know they're coming, though. But that's all I got. Hubie? How'd you make out with the tree orders? Well, I guess it depends if you want to call it good or bad. I got made a few contacts, said we're looking at doing the TD tree days again. Um, need a community to have uh, some volunteers come from. And we got kind of positive response from Tilly and positive response from Alberta Conservation. Uh, but nobody really had any uh, sites. So I just told the TD ladies that, yeah, we're probably going to do it again. So they are going to send me the uh, letter of intent to sign and start the process. And how many trees? Uh, the minimum is 150. Last year our budget was 2,500 bucks, I believe. Uh, so by the time you factor everything in, you spend about 1,900 bucks on trees. And when you have to, you have to buy uh, native to the region trees and they have to be a certain um, maturity. So it kind of increases the cost per tree, but still good idea. Other questions? Other hard questions? Tough questions? No questions, Todd, so can we get a motion to accept Todd's report? Hubie moves. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. 
And we'll go to the weed inspector appointments. So for everybody that's been on council for a few years, you see these come every year, and I'm sure you're just excited to make these motions uh, so we can ruin these kids' lives forever uh, because you never get to go on a family vacation again without seeing all the weeds. So these are the two, uh, well, these are our four, sorry, vegetation management technicians, but the two new ones, Donovan Kopp and Stratton Pickett, they are our new ones, uh, so we'll be destroying their lives forever in regards to weeds and, and identification. So. The other ones are ruined. Emma, um, uh, her mother is uh, with us with, for the 4-H stuff, and <laughs> she said they can't go anywhere anymore. She, just, just shut up, Emma. <laughs> so and if you know Mary Lean, that's exactly what she would say. So <laughs> it's quite funny. It, uh, those are good people to send out into our communities. You know, like it's neat to be able to identify weeds. Cool. All right, we need some... Uh, Motions because these guys are getting. There's two motions, right? Yeah, seven and ten. Okay, Ellen moves uh, first motion to appoint pursuant to section seven. All in favor? Opposed. Motion is carried, and we need somebody else for a pursuant to section ten motion. Tracy moves. All in favor? Opposed. Motion is carried. Policy review. We're going to get into the hawk nesting pole business. Well, I don't know if we are or not, but it's a great discussion, and that's why Will's here today because he's the one that uh, put everything together, and I think he did a great job. Um, it's been a long time since we had a new policy. I think the club route one was the last new one, and and that took us some time to get together, and uh, and this one was no different. I think in any integrated pest, <clears throat> pardon me, in any integrated pest management plan, I think you have to have more than one. Uh, tool in your toolbox. So chemical control of uh, ground squirrels is, is great, it works well, um, but we need other options for producers. And one of the things we know is that hawks can eat up to 500 ground squirrels for one nesting pair. So that's a considerable amount. Um, but the, there are some other um, things that come with hawks. They don't necessarily just eat gophers or, or ground squirrels. Um, so we wanted to kind of outline a few things uh, so that producers would be aware of some of the problems that may come from increasing the, uh, the uh, amount of hawks maybe in their area. Um, the other thing, I don't believe it's going to maybe increase the amount of hawks that we see. It's just going to give them other options for where to, to nest and be. Um, because that was one thing uh, me and Will had talked about. Maybe we don't want to um, promote something that's going to change the natural balance. But just because we give them another place to nest doesn't mean it's a completely new pair that's living there. It's just they have a better nest or a different nest to be at. Um, we we kind of tried to make it so that there was minimal amount of um, our interference in where the pole would go. Uh, because if we do that, there's a lot of things we don't know about landowner's land. Um, some of those being if their species at risk, um, if they're close to a natural or a, a wetland, a classified wetland. And these are areas that, <clears throat> or, or things that are, are around that we wouldn't be able to put a nesting pole up. So we don't know that. Um, and we would have to do and commission a study to find those things out, which would extend <laughs> putting in a pole up to a year um, and it would be, a, it'd be cost prohibitive. So we know that landowners know their land the best to know where the ground squirrels are, where the wetlands are, where the, you know, um, the things that would bother the, the hawks to be there. Um, so we know that. So that's why we left all of the decision making up to the landowners. And what we want to do is build them and deliver them so that they can be put up. That's kind of where we want to, uh, to be. Make it easy to, to do if that makes any sense. Questions, Wayne? <clears throat> uh, what does Fish and Wildlife say to this, and also what would be the cost of a pole? Great question. Did, I don't think... Uh, a number of years ago... Uh, you might want to come up here, buddy. Sorry, Will, you can't uh, be heard sorry. sometimes even at the mics. In I here. gotta get involved. <laughs> so a, a number of years ago there was a study done and there was actually uh, some hawk nesting poles put up in the area. I don't know if you've seen out by Builder Shimes here, there's a couple of them still standing there. And uh, 
so I did contact this lady that originally did the study and uh, her opinion was that yes, we have to do a biological assessment of every poll that we put in. That was her thoughts on it. So we did think a little bit different because that would just, yeah, that makes the, the project impossible. And that's why we put the guidelines in place. So Fish and Wildlife, we never did talk to Fish and Wildlife. So uh, cost of a pole, I think is, by the time we get it built is around $125, I think. Other questions? So basically you want to try and get some information back from people before you embark on this? Yeah, so this is kind of new to us. We're, uh, because we often operate the same programs year after year, we don't often have to go out for public consultation on introducing a new program. Um, so this would kind of be new and we thought this might be a great place to um, introduce maybe a communication, some feedback from uh, from our ratepayers on that. So that's, I guess, uh, probably where we need to go unless council just thinks this is a great idea and, uh, you know, we can allow the, the program to speak for itself or, you know, we can uh, create a short survey, see if there's interest in it, um, see what the, the feedback is, whether it's positive, negative, if we have to change something, adjust, whatever, uh, bring it back to council for um, final approval at a later time. So, get this season in with them or if we did short feedback it wouldn't be that quick oh certainly i think we could have them built for the to put them in in the fall oh, okay in order to i think we have to put them in like right now if in order to kind of get the, the nesting for this yeah. year yeah so which is probably not a bad thing so that they can see it's there and uh, over the winter and maybe get the in the spring hmm. yeah so we're starting to move strict nine now, so maybe we can do a short, short survey with the people that come in to purchase strict nine if Perfect. they are willing, willing to partake in this or not. Yeah, that would be a good idea. Maybe in a different field from where they're putting their strict nine. <laughs> no, I think that'd be a good way to get some feedback and uh, yeah, even if you get them out like you said, ahead of the next year's breeding season would be good. Kelly. So I think that's option number four in our um, list. RFD, yeah. So I'd be willing to move that. Okay. Option four. All right, no further discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Thanks, Kelly. Yes, thanks, Kelly. Uh, you obviously did the same things in school that I did. In multiple choice, you always pick the longest answer because you know that's how the teachers work. So and that's awesome. <coughs> Excuse me. Go ahead. There's also uh, the, the agreement, all the policy in the agreement there. Yeah, and I guess our intention was to leave the agreement outside of the policy um, just so that it can be changed with relative ease um, if there's something that is uh, not working or not right, um, which is kind of similar to our rental policy. We have the policy for rentals, but not all the agreements in place. So it's kind of, um, I think it outlines pretty good the some of the restrictions that uh, should be considered before a landowner puts it together or puts it in, sorry. Just, just right now, see, uh, I think under your, on that nesting, uh, the agreement, the first little square box should not be set up within a thousand meters of locations. Where, maybe, so should be H in that. I was telling uh, Brian and Tracy yesterday on our trip home, we talked a lot about this agenda, even though we didn't really, we were trying to remember what was on it, but across the river in special areas one summer, uh, people approached, some group approached John about putting up these things because there were nests in this little slewy area. So they did, and I asked him last night, I said, did anything, 
I said, I told this story the way I remember it. Did I tell it wrong? And he said, no, no, the, the platforms, they called them. He said, I never saw them get nested in. And he said, I don't even know if those, if the original birds ever came back after they were built. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to look this spring when we go across to, to check it out again. But we'll have better luck in the county of Newell, I know. <laughs> Anything else for these esteemed gentlemen? Hubie. I've seen him in the county of Vulcan near the river. Have you guys checked out to see how, the, how they've done over there? They've been there for a long time. I have not. You would have to tell me where they are for us to go and look at them. Fire me an email. When you, you go north of the Husky Battery there, right on the highway. Take that trail <laughs> north. Sounds like farmer directions to me. I don't know the exact location. It's just the years I was peddling grilling bits out there. I just noticed all the platforms. You know what? I love a road trip, and the wild goose chase is even better. So <laughs> this is perfect. Maybe you can see the medicine wheel too. <laughs> Hubie, take note next next trip. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Have a good rest of the day. Item 10-3 is a funding request from the Brooks and District Seniors outreach for their $1,000 they've been getting for a few years for their delightful steak dinner in June. Wayne? Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. And the next item is for a letter of support which Ariana and I did some research on, and there's information there. It came from the Francophone Association of Brooks, and it's a request for, um, they apply for a federal grant, and they have to do some backup information. And uh, in 2015, organizations like us also supported their motion, and they got some money, so, or supported their plan. The grant and so if you could move a motion to support it again that would be awesome Wayne thank you all in favor opposed motion is carried item 10-5 and this is what I was rambling on about this morning so that's more of um, information item for for us, I believe, for our communities, or if you know of people that might be. Yeah, I think the intent is just to get it, the information out there, and if there's individuals that you're aware of, or if any members of council are aware of this, interested, the opportunity is there. It's interesting how we come up with new words for things, like obviously the new word is animator. And I, it was used in our, at our convention once, too, and I thought, oh, a new buzzword. So it sounds like sort of a, an interesting thing to promote, actually. All right, item 10.6, Council Payment Sheets. Any comments or troubles with compensation review? Or motion, Anne-Marie? Anne-Marie moves acceptance. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. And requests for, oh no, direct debit register first. Any questions about the different payment registers? If not, a motion to accept. Clarence moves to accept the payment register. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Request for function of council. <clears throat> Uh, 
I had asked uh, our deputy Reeve to attend something on Monday, economic, our economic development branch of joint services is having a strategic planning session Monday, right, Tracy and Lionel? Monday, 9 to 12? And I am engaged Monday morning um, and cannot attend. Brian is also unable to attend. And by his own misfortune, Clarence, just at the break before lunch, came up to me and he said, he was asking me questions about economic development, and I said, hmm, do I have a job for you? Because <laughs> it's a strategic planning session, so I suggest that unless someone else is dying to do this, that we move that Clarence attend as a function of counsel. <laughs> it's all his fault. Wayne? I'll make the motion. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Clarence is opposed. <laughs> you lost, buddy. I said I was going to. No, he had some really good questions, so I said, perfect. A strategic planning session. So. Okay, thank you. I'll, and if I may, I'll just carry on with my new 111 and then you'll be done with me. So, um, Bow River Basin Forum was held March 13th. Um, several really good items. I didn't know this before, some of you probably did, but Bill C-68 actually defines, this is new, defines water quality within the FISH Act. So that's something new and um, not sure the ramifications, but it is something new in that, uh, in that bill. Um, also, uh, sustainable development adopted by the UN establishes 17 goals in all countries, which is a change, a slight change from previous goals, which always focused on developing in third world countries. So, and, and so these goals were, were uh, adopted by um, developed countries too. And um, another speaker talked about the Calgary River Valley, Calgary River Valley Group. And um, they did some restorations and repairing in their areas along the Elbow River. And they had sort of a unique concept that was quite intriguing. They used it along the same lines as uh, like a home improvement or home reveal type concept. So they had before or after, they had input. The, they were able to really bring in uh, local people that lived along or lived in that community to be part of it. And it was, it was quite successful. They're hoping to replicate it and um, something that... Uh, that uh, they encouraged others that are doing other types of work along those areas to get people involved. Um, low impact development in urban areas that captures excessive runoff and diverts them to a bioretention catchment beds and the design of the, of the soil and the design of the beds also caters to the capture of these waters to be used during the, during the drier periods. And then probably the most uh, intriguing one was uh, uh, a doctor from the, or professor from U of C that's working at the Pine Creek Water Trace Wastewater Treatment Plant. And he talked about several different things. One of them um, talked about the, the, you know, drugs that are, that are entering our, that are being discharged into our, that are passing through our bodies and going into the waste streams. And they actually said that, he actually said that they can, um, some of them street drugs, um, that they can actually detect the levels of increases, like, and they know that if, if there's a end of the month payday on a Friday, Tuesday is about the day they're going to get the results of that, that'll, that they'll see the elevated amounts of cocaine, like, in the water system. It, yeah. And so they're working on ways to actually to, to treat those types of things, and and um, and also the uses of, of some of the some of the uh, ways to use more natural type vegetables. So they're doing some research stuff. There. They've got 12 channels that they've they've uh, put into there that they're just using for research. And the water passes through these channels. Use naturals like cattails and shrubs and stuff. That's that's uh, uh, that they they haven't planted any of them. They said they just have let them establish. Um, within their own, and they're just using it as a treatment system. 
Um, he also talked about um, developing algae that would actually be used to control the blue-green algae. That's uh, like in uh, Eagle Lake and other areas. So it actually used to combat that. So that's some of the some of the. Um, and also algae that we could be used in feedlot manure because you know he talked about how what an incredible biofuel market that would be and if you could just harness that energy and and use it to uh, for biofuel and also to reduce the aroma so of course i had to put that into our uh, my report reducing the aroma when it comes to effluent so um and then the final thing that he spoke about was the technology that currently exists in wastewater treatment is uses chlorine, ozone, and UV to treat bacteria. Well, bacteria, as Mother Nature is, is able to adapt and, and some are able to survive and they are genetically adapting and, um, and of course we treat potable water with exactly the same things, chlorine, ozone, and UV. So Ultimately, you are treating them with the same thing, and the, and the danger is, is, is of the superbugs and the abilities, the inabilities for us to have um, like hospitals and, and uh, medical care that uses um, 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 antibiotics, and they develop resistance to that. And just for an example, he said, you know, in our lifetimes, we might see, if you happen to live to be 100 years old, you'll see five generations. Well, some of these bacteria can reproduce every 20 minutes. So think about how that's expounded and how nature is able to um, evolve to the point. Now he said, after saying all of that, he says, I'm not worried about it because he says, I still drink water out of the tap. And he says, when I go up to our cabin at the lake, he says, if I'm thirsty, I actually drink water out of the lake because it's pristine. So he says, I'm not here to alarm people, but that's the kind of work that they're working with. And they're, you know, if you, they'll continue to do work on that. So it was fascinating. Um, Newell 911, uh, our last meeting with, was last Thursday in GEM, and we finally, we accepted the tender from, from Bearcom um, for the radios that we've been looking at for the last, I don't even know how many years, but um, actually come down to that, and, and it was great the way um, um, Keith, Keith did a fantastic job in, in, uh, and he, he used a lot of resources from within our administrations to rate the tender and they're able to parcel out, you know, what they want and what they want. They don't have to accept everything within the tender. So, um, you'll see that coming forward. Your fire departments will start seeing the, we probably won't have delivery of the first ones till July, but, uh, that's the intent that your fire departments will, will have those radios, um, sometime this summer or late summer. And that's it. Any questions? Just a question, Brian. Where was that sample taken when you said it's if it's payday and then on Tuesday they noticed it? Where was that exactly taken? Well, the, the research they're doing is at the Pine Creek wastewater, but I think that's replicated throughout the city of Calgary. And so they're just sampling at the wastewater treatment plants. And so they're able to determine level changes. But I mean, they're, 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 uh, they said they have the most unique lab in the world there. Like there's other labs in, in Europe and stuff that do a lot of research, but they actually, they're quite proud of the fact that in conjunction with the University of Calgary and, 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 um, and the Calgary Wastewater Treatment uh, Facilities, they do some work there that can't, that's not being replicated in any 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 country in the world so you know and it's really sophisticated like I mean they're detecting stuff down to the uh, micro milla um, to the thousandth uh, degree so I mean it's sophisticated stuff is it alarming um, while they're treating it so the stuff that they're putting back in the river is safe is what they're saying but it's still one of those trends that they're seeing over the years where you know um, use and, and drug use within our culture is becoming um, more, more common, and uh, that's being uh, seen in the wastewater treatment. So, two, two fairly quick reports. Um, we had uh, FCSS meeting last night, and and the main thing from that is that. Uh, 
our senior citizen or citizen of the year and junior citizen of the year has been named and the citizen of the year is uh, Jason Thomason who we know from Bandits fame uh, Bombers fame Bombers getting mixed up with my bees but, and he also does a lot of work for baseball and at the high school level and so forth and, um, junior citizen of the year is Madison Gilborn young lady and duchess. The, uh, <clears throat> that's about all for FCSS, but uh, just a quick um, couple things mentioned from NRSC. We, we had uh, some major problems with water leaks uh, over, the, I guess, the last 10, well, two weeks or now, I guess. It's all fixed now, but it, it took quite a while. First one was in Rosemary. Um, they couldn't find the leak exactly. They dug and dug, and finally they found it. And then what happened is they got some ma major leaks in Bizano, which they didn't have. They had to basically make a judgment call on which one they fixed first. And the reservoir was getting low in Bizano, so they rushed to Bizano, put the water back on with the leak still, at, still in Rosemary. Um, so it took better part of a week to get both of them under control. Um, the one thing that I think came out of it, it was a major, uh, it's probably the first time in our history that we've had something that took that long to fix. And that also highlighted perhaps that we need a little better communication with our, our municipalities, but also somehow get the message out to to people who all of a sudden see their their reservoirs or their tanks or their cisterns going low and and they think it's because they haven't heard anything they think it's in their yard so they get start getting worried and where do we look and you know, of course it's it's easy just to make a phone call but some of us rural residents don't even know where to call yet and so forth so the long and the short of it um, certainly um, NRSC and Jeff are going to get together and, and see how, you know, if something like this happens again, how do we, how do we get the communications out quicker? And so that's going to be addressed because I know a lot of people were asking questions. What the solution is, I'm not quite sure, but I think we need a common message. Um, so cer certainly we have to divide responsibilities, make sure everybody knows. And sometimes when you get these things, uh, NRC was a little short-staffed uh, at the time, so it made for a lot of overtime hours. So the first first uh, responsibility, of course, is to do the physical work to get the thing fixed. And but I think we can do a better job with communications, and we'll work towards that. And that's it. Uh, who paid for that? Because it was in Bizano and in Rosemary in the in the municipalities, right? It's, it's part of the main line. The, from my understanding is the, the one in Rosemary will be in RSC because it's part of their infrastructure and part of the one in, Rose, in Bizano will be Bizano's. Okay. That's my understanding. Anything else? Thanks, Clarence. Um, Short Grass Library. Just uh, real quick, um, I brought a copy of the audited financial statement to keep on file, and I'll pass that over to Lane. Um, operations are, are smooth there. Um, they came out um, in the blue again this year, so there will be um, some monies put back into libraries um, as a result. So. Shortgrass is doing well, and <coughs> the renovations at the office are proceeding. They are behind schedule, but they are proceeding. So stay tuned for closure on that. And June, we meet again for another strategic planning. That's my report. Thanks, Kelly. No questions? All right. Um, Lionel, no recycling and regional solid waste. Uh, regional solid waste is, is working quite well. 
Um, it, it really, uh, it's, it's, it's not, not very exciting other than the fact that we get rid of our garbage. Um, recycle, though, is a little different situation. Uh, the CARES conference was in uh, High River uh, at the beginning of the month. And it, um, recycling is, is, is trying to operate on a shoestring budget and it's difficult. Generally, the product just does not have the value that it needs to make it a, a very viable project. But we are still, still continuing ahead. One, one um, topic that came up was um, a deposit system on hard plastic packaging, like those clamshell packaging. It's a, it's a product that has, uh, would have lots of value in a, in a waste energy system because there's lots of energy in it. But in the landfill, it's kind of bulky and it, it creates some problems there. So there's some talk about the possibility of putting on a, uh, a uh, manufacturer's deposit on all that packaging and then that money getting recycled or getting transferred to the recycle depots in Alberta, which would really help us out if it did, if it did come about the way they're thinking, because that would take care of the deficit that we're running in the recycle depot, which is around 300,000 a year. It's kind of ugly, but felt that there's still some value there to maintain that subsidy for them to keep the material out of the landfill. So that was the, the highlight of the conference that I, that I got out of it. Uh, there were a number of other topics and I, I'm negligent, I forgot my notes. <laughs> but uh, it, it, was, it was interesting, it was an interesting conference, and, which it normally is. And that's about all I have to uh, report on. Questions for Lionel? You know, I bet if you ask the average person putting stuff in their garbage at home, those clamshell things drive me crazy because they flop open, try to squish them shut or rip them apart so they, you know, and spoon them and, and then they just, I just go, okay, just take out the garbage. <laughs> it's all just too big. And it's a lot of material. Yeah. Every one of them has a lot of material in it. Interesting. Lionel, or uh, Brian. Um, we, uh, <clears throat> I sat in on the uh, recycling um, breakout session yesterday, and uh, it was interesting. They talked a lot about EPR, the end of product uh, recycling, or re end of product, is that what it's called? End of product recycling? Anyways, where they are going to um, force manufacturers of, of components, products, plastics, etc., to be responsible for uh, at the end of this end of this end of that an, end of that particular thing's life um, that they have to res be responsible for the cost of recycling it or disposing of it and um, they said they've done that BC has done it and uh, I I've, I found it sort of humorous they they thought that big business would be the or the business I shouldn't they never use the word big business but manufacturers are. Um, have returned $74 million in British Columbia to the province for this and that was great because it didn't, it wasn't at the expense of the consumer and I guess in my mind I thought well who do you think they're passing the cost on to so it was, uh, it was you know nobody challenged them on it and, and you know the concept is great but the, f the fact of the matter is that somebody will pay for it and it's most likely the consumer that's going to pay for it. But the only thing that's encouraging about it is so any efforts they can do to manufacture and reduce that impact will be uh, you know if, if a business can save money doing it they will be motivated which does take that away from the from the um, consumer so I'm just curious if you guys had any any more information on it not more information basically the same that you just brought up um, 
I think you have to be fairly careful because if you put it at the manufacturer's level, they're just going to pass it on. So there'd be no incentive for them to reduce that packaging, which is, which is ultimately the, the goal would be to have it reduced, not just charged and, and because the consumer does pay in the end, not the manufacturer. Well, just an uh, invitation to everybody to uh, come to the Citizen of the Year Banquet, which is, which is April the 5th, 6 o'clock at the Heritage. And the following Saturday is the Expo Communities Honoring Communities, and it's in Jam. Ariana has tickets for that, $15 each. Uh, it's the Saturday the 13th, 5.30 to 8.30. Could be a special after party party if some of the councillors show up. <laughs> Lionel. And also one thing I forgot was that uh, Recycle Depot's uh, AGM is March 27th at 7 o'clock at the depot. I'm sure you're all going to want to be there. <laughs> Ariana, do you have tickets for the, uh, for the Citizen of the Year too? No? Okay, so you'll have to get them from FCSS. Or I think the Heritage also sells them. Pardon? Nice uh, evening, the citizen of the year. To, uh, I think it's a very heartening evening because you see what goes on in your community. We all know about volunteers, but all of the people that have been nominated are also recognized through... I think that's what I have to do, isn't it, Ariane? That's one of the jobs they hand out. I think I have to recognize the nominees. Yeah, so, and... Mr. Amulung's lovely wife, Janine, is a, one of the nominees, so it's always nice. I forget who the others are. Do you remember, Ariana, who the other nominees were? Yeah, can't remember. But. Anyhow. Okay, um, any other committee reports? I've had a few things going on since uh, last meeting, and... Um, just locally, we had a rec board meeting in JAM, and it hit me, sort of, uh, I'm sure all of our rec boards put a bit of money into, if you have a local school in your area, the schools may be asking for some of that money, which I just struck me as another thing that our recreation dollars are often going towards, and it's for recreational needs, but um, it was just something I noticed more this year. And we also had a JAM Community Association meeting the next night. So I have two meetings a year in JAM, and they were two nights in a row. It was like, what? Anyhow, um, last, that was Monday and Tuesday. Last Thursday, the Montreal Canadiens alumni played a Crossroads Clinic Challengers uh, fundraiser thing. So I was part of the puck drop um, thing there. You know, those of you who uh, worked with Darby Lester, Darby Sutter, she was one of the, the volunteer hockey players and her dad was there as a coach, I think, sort of, wasn't it? Sandra, no? Did he, he didn't play. Did he play? Okay. I didn't think he was suited up. Whatever the case, yeah. It was a pretty good evening for fundraising. And um, just a couple of highlights from the convention. Um, the Mayors and Reeves meeting, which is always sort of not always, but sometimes interesting. A couple of things that came out of that was uh, Leanne Beaupre from Grand Prairie, County Grand Prairie, which is sort of a similar uh, setup to ours, lots of oil and gas revenue. And she spoke about, Brian, were you there when she was speaking? About the, you know, the uh, 
the last big time that people met at Davos, Switzerland for um, energy, climate change, and all the sort of social issues, and the, and the United Nations part of some of this, and one of the things is about conservation of land, and apparently there's 16 targets in this biodiversity plan, and uh, that the federal government has agreed to do by 2021, or try to reach. And I think that's part of why, you know, the Yellow Jacket movement, but that movement has brought in other things about immigration and uh, that is, this is part of it. And she said one of the things is that 17%, they want 17% of land to be protected. This is, and the province of Alberta has opted into the federal plan. So 17% of land to be, have as protected area in Alberta. And a lot of it is targeted in the north, so the northern uh, counties are quite concerned about this. And she said that in the next two years or so, if the province gets big, big horn, and, and you know how fast that all happened and how people were all up in arms? Well, they're, they're very concerned about the lack of consultation, but she said that if the province gets that and one more area, they will have in fact reached 18%. So there's also species at risk discussion thrown in here too, and she felt that municipalities should be able to, or somebody did, I think it was her that mentioned it, that municipal reserve is also something that you know province or municipal governments do. And she talked about this land stuff being as only one of 20 goals of this plan, and great concern about this government not ever consulting um, you know, just sort of telling people about it after the fact, which certainly was seemed pretty obvious with the Bighorn uprising at the time, and they sort of pulled back a little bit about that. The other uh, item of interest for me at this conference, and it started it with the Mayors and Reeves agenda, was all the linear taxation issues, and something I didn't know, I guess some of the counties have viable companies now that are not paying their taxes because there's other companies not paying taxes it's sort of uh, or have gone bankrupt not paying taxes but it's there is some there are some viable companies paying taxes and um, there has been some court challenges Virginia Hills uh, Carolyn our favorite person at conventions from Northern, or from uh, yeah, Northern Sunrise, they have launched a court appeal regarding linear tax taxation that's been lost. Um, and there's three municipalities going to the Supreme Court: Woodlands County, Lamont Co County, and Northern Sunrise. And she talked about how we should, as an organization, be getting behind this. So. Uh, Al suggested to her perhaps that she should have brought a resolution to the floor <laughs> if they in fact are serious because that's how we could get behind them. That, that has not happened yet, but uh, it might come next fall if this is, I'm sure this will all still be going on. Because um, Kevin and I yesterday, the last session, and I don't know, maybe somebody else was at that one, Hubie was at it also, the last breakout session that I went to was about understanding unpaid linear property taxes and it was presented by one of the lawyers, the Reynolds Mirth Group, which always puts a special spin on it, but Kevin, I, I don't know, I have some notes on my phone I'm going to find. Do you have anything or Hubie to comment about that, what you learned? I think it adds up to 96 million not paid in the province, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the, there's no easy way to recoup linear currently, and um, these court challenges right to the Supreme Court is, is only one means to try to clarify it. Um, I think it's, it's a real fear for municipalities. It'll be real, real fear for ours, because I mean, our, uh, our arrears are approaching close to a million dollars uh, with regards to that. 
So there's it, you can collect sometimes with um, going after assets if you know that they have some assets, but there's no cheap recourse. And you can, as the presenter said, you can you have to weigh real carefully whether you pursue it legally or whether you don't, because it can end up costing you money in a quick hurry, and you don't collect anything. So. I think what we have to do is put pressure on the province to change um, the regulations and the acts so that there is no loopholes or there is no gray area that taxation be all consistently treated, um, whether it's linear, M&E, buildings. And I think that's where it's got ahead. You, as soon as you leave something that's gray, um, companies are gonna start to use it and continue to use it. and. Uh, at the end of the day, the way it's set up now with the losses, it's going to be the rest of the taxpayers that are going to have to pick up the offsets, right? So that's certainly where I would focus is trying to get the legislation changed with the new government so that it's clear and, and um, you know, the rest of the taxpayers prote protect it. There shouldn't be one area that gets a better benefit than the next tax taxpayer does with regards to paying their tax bill. Well, excuse me. Well, I just had a question. Would it be something as simple as the province um, um, suspending a drilling permit or an operating permit for those companies until that uh, their their arrears are cleared up? I mean, at least then you're capturing the ones that are viable. So it's it's as simple as that, as far as I'm concerned. I don't know. What do you think, Kevin? Yeah, I think I think what they need to do is is get a committee together and look at all options like that. Um, because in some cases, you know, they'll pay uh, linear taxes for one municipality and they will be the same company and they won't pay for another one. And so the, the presenter had said that, you know, you need to, to check around and find out because if they're paying for one municipality, that means they have money, is what she said. Well, does it? I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I think any time that you can... You know, there has to be a reasonable notice period of, of not being paying taxes and getting penalties and paying them, but at some point in time you have to be able to put a trigger in place where they're shut down or other assets are, are leaned. Uh, something needs to be clear and concise when it's gray like this. There were three ministers present for the... Uh whatever it's called, ministerial forum. And some of the questions, people had lots of questions. It was sort of funny because Brian Mason, the, the writ was dropped, but they had promised to have some ministers there, so they sent these three people. And Brian Mason was done as the writ was dropped, so he was the happiest guy up on the stage, and he truly was. You could tell he was glad to be done. Sarah Hoffman was the other person, and Shay Anderson, who had spoken to us already, and yeah, as far as I'm concerned, Shay just sort of talks and talks, but never says anything. But there were lots of questions for them, which surprised me. I didn't know why people bothered, but I had I wrote down some of the questions. Um, it was about one of the parks. There was lots of questions that they wanted sent to Shannon Phillips. So Shannon Phillips has got people upset about parks for sure. Parks without municipal involvement, like announcing, planning, anything crazy to do. Somebody wants license plates on the fronts of cars as well so that crooks can't just back out of your yard after they've robbed you and you can't get their license plate number. Um, there was talk about internet still being a huge issue and roads and road and bridge problems still. Um, I have written down farmland, I don't know what that was about. Beaver Lodge Hospital, there was a question about it taking a long time to get fixed up. It's sort of reminiscent of the Bizano problems because it, it apparently is the oldest hospital in the province. So. And for those of you who ever get the opportunity, we all who heard her would recommend Vivian Krauss, 
if you get to read about her or see her on TV, uh, she is um, she's just chased down some of the information through a lot of hard work, I'd say, and um, I just it was about money that's funneled been funneled out of mainly the the states to promote activism against our oil and gas industry. And, I mean, there would be people that would say it's all a conspiracy theory, but what she has done is proven through all sorts of documents um, that, in, in, in fact, all these foundations exist and have written checks out here, there, and everywhere, big, big money to promote things that are very harmful to our our provincial economy. Um, she is just quite a small, little, young female who just talked. She she had a lot to say. Like we we were disappointed she only spoke for half an hour. Eh? Like we could have heard her, listened to her for much longer. And right at the end, something she really she said, "Do I have a few more minutes left?" That she really wanted to tell us. She flashed up one last. Uh, document and Gerald Butts who has been the uh, chief of staff for Justin Trudeau and it was a check that had been written out to him for almost $400,000 from one of these questionable foundations that just appeared to be funneling money here and there but it was a uh, he'd re resigned and so that's what he got for resigning so the like, environmental reserves. Was it an environmental reserves group? Yeah, and it was the ones that were behind, well, that have been promoting these environment, like the 17% reserve that the province has committed to. That was that group. So it was really quite eerie, because she did, I mean, there's lots of conspiracy theories always, but, you know, she, she started her presentation with a picture of, it was in BC, an Indigenous fellow face down in the snow with the RCMP sort of paratrooper looking guys, you know, got him there. And she said, like, what, what, would ever, what would anybody ever think that this is a fair representation of our Canada? You know, that this is, and this was a picture that had appeared in the Washington Post or New York Times. You guys remember which one? She said that was just so. She, she said that was part of the thing that triggered her interest in this. Like, who's doing this? Who would be that interested to do this stuff? So, she's got a lot of information and has become her name. I've heard her name lots recently. So, Anne Marie. So, so Vivian was making people aware of all this. Did she also offer? what we needed to do to stop it or to... Right. <laughs> she, was, she was quite um, quite succinct in saying as municipalities, um, we have an opportunity to be through FCM and through our own organizations to bring this stuff to light. Because ultimately that's the only way it'll change when people start questioning about uh, why we aren't building, and uh, why is it only Alberta that's not that's against it? Well, it turns out there's a there's a network of of funds that are being channeled to organizations and people to deliberately stop this and basically prop up the price of oil and gas for companies to make huge dollars in the U.S. in order to keep ours basically under their thumb. Um, yeah, it was it was fascinating. It really was. Yeah, it was sort of a call out to municipalities to get more involved, or, or our provincial organization, truly. And so the FCM is meeting in is it Montreal or Quebec City, this Quebec City in, in the spring. So I think uh, AUMA, they all talked about that, what they're, they're trying to make sure that some of these, this information and the rumors get dispelled. There was also a, a very talkative man from Halifax who's on their board who said that um, he supported, they, that FCM supports um, Alberta and their oil and gas industry. So 
you might, any of you who are going might be involved in protests and things for all you know when you're there. So get ready. <laughs> Hubie, is it Hubie and Wayne? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> No, I plan on uh, raising the voice quite loudly, but where can I get, get this information on what she's researched? I'd just say Google her for a start. Here's, here's her name on the top of the book there. Anne-Marie? You know, good, good on her for bringing this to light. Um, I had to think about supply management too. And there is more topics where we probably don't even know where they get their money from and how they get their information out there. And, and you, you probably have maybe some more knowledge about that too. There's lots of topics where we, we don't know what's behind it. No, very true. And big money is everywhere. I mean, we, we have said it around this table lots that money, money controls everything. And, uh, yeah. This, this is about a lot of boat money, yeah. QB and Wayne? Well, well, she said it started years ago. 12 years ago it started already, but they started small and just got bigger and bigger. Like the, the spirit bear was just a small portion of northern BC. Now it's been changed for the whole western coast. That's so how big it's gotten. Managed to get the ear of the prime minister. He sat right next to him, didn't they? These people. They give him four hundred thousand as a. Okay. Yes, Kevin. One of the things that she said is that you know they are making some changes in the states too, and tightening up regulations uh, for oil and gas except not in Texas, North Dakota, and the places that are actually going nuts with it. And that there's a whole pile of investments going in to attract companies up to $1 billion of, of attraction to bring them in. So the tax policy of the way it is here in Alberta and Canada is pushing everything there and then their policies attracting them and they don't have, we're not, we're not even in the same ballpark in terms of trying to, trying to compete. So I thought that was, pretty interesting. The other thing that she had mentioned is that we need to focus on getting our products here to, uh, to the Asian markets, right? And there's a huge roadblock to that. And that single-handedly single will be uh, one of the biggest solutions is if there can be some way to get it over there because their usage is forecasted to go nuts in the next 30 years, even with electric vehicles. And if we as a country can't pull together to make that happen. <laughs> I had a great conversation yesterday in the food line. We were hurrying to leave, but we quickly grabbed some food. And so you guys remember Bart Guion from Brazil County. He always talks lots. And he's, we were talking about the election. And so this guy behind me, oh, I know, I said, I said, I have no, no idea who's going to win the election or something. And he said, well, the guy behind me chimed in. He said, well, I, I predict the NDP won't even be in the opposition. And I said, oh, so who do you think will be the opposition? And he said, well, maybe the Alberta party. But he said, I think the NDP will just be wiped out. And he said, and then Jason Kenney will, you know, he should join forces and I've, he said, I've talked to him about this, but he won't commit yet with the Alberta Separatist Party. <laughs> and then we should begin to pull out of Canada, and I, out of the confederation that is not even, has never, isn't functioning and was set up by the British Empire to funnel money to the empire. And I just, I was just like, oh, where did you come from? Like, what rock? Anyhow, I said, you know what? I'm from the county of Newell, and we're leading, one of the leading municipalities of having a regionalized system of government. So we're into coming together, not <laughs> blowing up and pulling apart. And he said, oh. 
And I, fortunately, I sued the line and went back to where we were sitting and I said, oh, wow, everybody's going crazy. <laughs> okay, what's next? Anything, uh, any other committee reports? Hey, would you mind sharing with the group a little bit about the coffee shop and the hospitality shop talk uh, that we were all inundated with in regards to regional uh, regional planning? It was sort of the the overlying topic. Without the didn't matter where we went, it was uh, people were asking us questions. Well, f first of all, I have to tell you how proactive our new uh, Foothills Little Bowl chair is. Look out, Ariana. <laughs> you thought I, uh, yeah, Southeast mayors and Reese drove you crazy. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Brian set up, a, this Brian, along with Brian Bruin, set up a meeting after the mayors and Reese meeting on Monday night to uh, meet to talk about things, but it seemed like that was all they wanted to talk about. So carry on, Brian. You're, that was your doing, so you can talk about that part. Well, just to, to back up, is I, I just had thought when, when Brian ran for the position that, you know, one of his key things is he wanted to try to do a better job communicating with the municipalities. So I reached out to him a couple of weeks ago, and, and he never replied back till he got back from holidays, apparently, <laughs> on, like, Saturday night. And uh, anyway, so we set up it real quick, and... And he suggested after the mayors and Reeves meeting, because a lot of the Reeves and deputy Reeves were there. So, and that's who I, I I targeted. I just said, you know, if we just keep it to Reeves or, or deputy Reeves, and and they're in the room. And and uh, so, anyways, he he took the meeting and he talked a little bit about what they what he's been dealing with and the board's been dealing with with MSI. And and Al was there and offered a little bit of support. And then he opened it up and he asked a couple questions of others, and then he directed it to Molly and myself as far as how the regional talks were going and so I shared that you know that uh, you know I've only been to one but the overall um, you know people had concerns and and um, and we were receptive to that but um, at the same time I think that uh, uh, you know there was a lot of curiosity I think from within that group and I know you know back in September when we met at Foothills Little Bow I had the opportunity at lunchtime to sit with a couple of different uh, councils, and that's when I talked about our initiative to start these, and they thought I was that we were nuts, and um, and I even heard the word communism in that same phrase, and uh, and uh, anyways, it, irregardless, I think in my opinion, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Molly, it almost seems like there's a softening of that that appetite because they're looking at this, they're looking at what we're doing and they're looking at their own communities and they're sort of starting to think, well, so we are similar in the way we support our mini munis. Um, maybe there's a better way to do that. And so there was a lot of questions in regarding how the process is going and what are some of the things that are on the table and, you know, it was right across the board. But, you know, so then you'd leave there and then You'd go to a hospitality suite and somebody, oh, you're new old. Oh, by the way, uh, how's these regions? You know, and I was actually shocked that there was that much interest in it. I, and I know Tracy and and I think Alan and and uh, and Wayne or sorry Hubie, you guys all said the same thing that it was didn't matter really where we went. We had people asking us questions about it. So, and I won't prolong it because there wasn't um, a lot more to add, but. Uh, I was watching when you were speaking at the people of the Foothills Little Bow, Jason Schneider from uh, County of Vulcan was sitting there nodding his head, and that's one of the communities I hear is really watching us. Mm -hmm. yeah, there. yeah, and um, oh, and Blair Painter, who's the mayor of the Crow's Nest Pass, he, somebody said to him, so Blair, tell us how it's been. And I mean, he wasn't, he was very blunt about it. He says, well, it isn't easy. It isn't easy. And he talked about, you know, what had happened. They were sort of forced to regionalize. But he said, it's okay. It's good now. Isn't, don't you think that was his sort of he, way? I mean, they have actually more, I think they're, they're, 
have a harder obstacles to go to than we have even today because he talked about when they first started they had four wastewater treatment plants they're down to two now they have they had six water treatment plants they have five they still have five and and there's frustration there but he said you know the, the unfortunate thing is there hasn't been any money from the province to follow and to help us out with some of these things and i think i sense frustration there but I don't think there was any ever any implications that he would turn the clock back and no. and redo the governance structure for sure because he said there was some struggles to begin with but it really works quite well now I, at least yeah. that's what I, I gleaned from his comments and my funniest story is the two hills people who had heard us speak a little bit sometime must have been in the fall talk about it uh, Stacy found me at a table and I was standing talking to her about it. She was asking all sorts of questions. One of, the, one of her other counselors joined her. Barry Morishita was around on, that was Monday night. He came up behind me, put his arm around my neck and, and hugged me and said, how's my favorite Reeve? And she looked at me and she looked at him and she said, are you the mayor of the city of Brooks? <laughs> It was perfect. You know, Barry was schmoozing, whatever the case. <laughs> but um, so sh he got involved in the conversation. And she said, well, don't you worry about, like, you're so big and, you know, blah, blah. And Barry said, I don't care if we have one counselor representing us. He said, you know, we've got all these groups. And he went on to explain our two county, two city, and the other muni rep reps at some of our other organizations. So Stacy always wanted to talk to us, did she, Tracy? She kept finding us to find another question to ask us. So it was, it was fun. And, I mean, we're honest about it. We said, hey, it's early and it may never happen, but we're looking at it, we're researching it, we're investigating, and it's our obligation as counselors to do that. So anything else before we get back to the agenda? Helen. Just a quick addition, it was rather interesting. I was talking to a councillor from Wood Buffalo, and I think her, her area was in Fort McMurray, I believe, and they are going to have a full review now of their um, regionalization for the first time. So interesting, she said, it's coming up. So and I think we all got an invitation to their municipality. Yeah. yeah, she says anytime if we have any questions we can oh. call them, yeah. One piece of news that I received yesterday from a councillor from Bassano, the uh, Monday night signed the ICF with the county physically, so just an update there. Yeah, so this was at Short Grass, and Deborah and Yoko were sitting there, and I said, oh, one down, six to go for the county. <laughs> Raw. And, um, and uh, Deborah says, well, um, uh, we've, we've looked at it. And I said, oh, really? I, didn't, I played dumb. I didn't realize that it went out. And uh, she said, uh, we have one question, I think, and... Maybe it was Bizanos that we should said, or that she saw, or they saw, but uh, it didn't sound like from Deborah. Okay. So yeah, so I just got an email um, this morning from Amanda, so that's good news. The interesting thing that I found, uh, I had three different meetings there, um, the CAO meetings with the ARMA group, the Mid-City, uh, counties uh, that are for the ICFs we had a meeting and then the, the RMA trade division I had a meeting with them as well um, but they questioned a lot of the meeting was spent on the regionalization concept and and um, everything that's behind it and what's good about it and what isn't good about it and so you're exactly right I think that people are thinking about it a lot more because it it, it took up a bunch of the discussions the interesting thing that I learned about uh, our discussions at the mid-city level is nobody's having any luck with their cities yet um, uh, to getting anything done and that the most of the agreements that are being signed 
um, are nowhere near as generous as a 50-50 across the board for recreation, like a place in Bassano and Duchess and, and Rosemary. Most places are looking at providing funding on a facility basis, looking at some type of usage, um, some type of grant structure. So I think, you know, we should be proud and the area should be proud that we're kind of leading the way with regards to that. The, bit, the, the reason that the cities aren't having much success is because they haven't come, come to the table with what, what they're expecting and whether they're too busy doing other things, I don't know, but it just seems like a common trend. Uh, but Red Deer County's got, I think he's got five of his all negotiated. He kind of led the way, Curtis, uh, but he hasn't had any communications with the city there. He said they have a new city manager coming, as far as he knows, um, but he doesn't know what. So we, we were trying to find out if there was, you know, certain positions and um, stances on the, those negotiations. And, you know, nothing from Lethbridge with Tasquins having a heck of a time, but they they have Peter that was appointed in um, Cyprus interim there for a while. He's going to be their city manager, so maybe things will move forward. But uh, Grand Prairie's having struggles um, getting theirs in place, so. It's not great news on, on that side of it for accomplishments. Of the year, a uh, request for a gift basket that we have donated. I think all the munis donate something. Kelly moves. All in favor, opposed, motion is carried. There's some information items. Uh, our post agenda item was an in camera item, I believe. So that looks like we've. I think we've covered it. Ariana, did we miss anything? We're good? Okay. Perfect. We'll need a motion to move in camera then. Clarence will move it. Thought he might. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried.